Hi, everyone. Welcome to Enritu's Lunch and Learn webinar. Today, we kick off a new VNA series with a presentation on VNA Fundamentals Part 1 Architecture and Measurements. This will be presented by Arno Patai, Field Applications Engineer with Anritsu. Before we get started, I wanted to go over a few items to help you participate in today's event. You have joined the presentation by listening to your computer's speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the telephone, just select phone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. Anytime during the presentation, you have the opportunity to submit text questions to the presenter by typing your question into the questions pane on the control panel. We will collect these questions and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded and you will receive an email within the next few days with a link to view the recording. I would now like to introduce Arno Patai. Thank you, Tina. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, I hope you're all keeping safe and and sound at home and staying healthy. Um, my name is Arno Patai, and uh, I'm a field application engineer here at Enritsu. Um, I've been with the company almost 20 years, uh, and I've been in product marketing, field sales, um, and, and now uh, field applications engineering. So uh, I have 35 years total uh, in the industry, RF microwave. Uh, so I welcome you all to this um, two-part webinar um, entitled Vector Network Analyzer or VNA Fundamentals. So this first part, uh, we will be talking about architecture of the instrument and measurements. And then we'll have a, a second part, which will be on air exactly one week from today. Um, <clears throat> as uh, many of you know, the VNA is really one of the most important instruments on uh, an RF or microwave engineer's test bench. Um, I like to think of it as the, as the Cadillac of the, of the bench. You may have other instruments revolving around it, but the VNA serves as, as really the key um, test and measurement instrument. Uh, so let's go through what we're gonna cover in the next two sessions. Today, we're gonna, as I mentioned, look at why um, users need VNAs. What's the purpose of the VNA in the, in the first place? Uh, some of the basic terminology and the measurements involved. So today we'll primarily talk about what we call S parameters, which are measurements of transmission and reflection characteristics of, of the devices we're gonna be testing with this instrument. We'll look at, uh, in quite some detail, we'll look at system architecture and really capture what are some of the key components um, within the instrument. Uh, in the second part, uh, we'll dive into the calibration methods because it's very important to understand that a VNA, unlike other instruments like spectrum analyzers and power meters that come with instrument calibrations from a CalLab, VNAs require uh, user calibration. So we'll talk uh, at length about um, what are the calibration methods and how those together with the VNA's base specifications um, contribute to the accuracy and uncertainty of the measurements that we're gonna make with the instrument. So this is very important to really understand how the VNA, first of all, how it works, how it makes the measurements, but then how it applies the error correction that's vital to uh, getting accurate measurements. Um, and then at the end of the session next week, we'll talk about advanced measurements as well that are beyond uh, the S parameters. So, Let's start off with why users need VNAs. Uh, the VNA is really uh, best thought of as, as a stimulus response instrument. In other words, it generates its own test signal uh, and then it applies it to the device and then it measures various signals that are coming back from the device, both signals that are transmitted through the device as well as reflected from either interface of the device. So we're looking typically at transmission reflection characteristics, and we'll talk in a moment about how we capture those measurements and then translate that into S parameters. VNAs are used in multiple environments. We characterize devices in R&D, 
in engineering. Um, we test devices uh, and subsystems in manufacturing. And we also have needs for VNAs uh, in the field to um, test at cell sites and other remote installations. VNAs are used with different packages and configurations. So this is where the challenges lie when we're trying to perform things like user calibration. How do we interface with the VNA? Do we need some fixturing? Do we need a probe station? Uh, there are other various methods that are, that are used to transfer the reference plane of our measurement to where we want it so that we're measuring just the device and nothing else that's connecting to the device. So we have to consider these different packages and configurations when we perform the user calibration that we'll cover next week. But we have most commonly coax devices. We have uh, two port, we have multi-port, we have differential inputs, single-ended, we have waveguide devices. We have devices that I mentioned are in fixtures. So that presents its own set of challenges. Probe stations, we're looking at semiconductor uh, wafers. And then we have another class of very interesting measurements called optoelectronic, where we're looking at um, E to O and O to E, which are cross-domain measurements. So we're um, measuring optical modulators and receivers and transceivers, and we're using an electrical VNA to do that. That'll be a subject of a whole nother webinar in the future. Uh, but the basic measurements, again, S parameters, forward and reverse transmission, forward reflection, reverse reflection. So those are your basic four S parameters. Um, for the two port case. But today's modern VNAs do a lot more than just that. They also, in addition to sweeping frequency, uh, they can also sweep power. They can also offset tune to other frequencies. So we can, we can look at other measurements that were typically done with other instruments, power meters, for example, for gain compression, uh, spectrum analyzers used to do IMD and harmonics. So we have a lot of flexibility in today's VNA hardware to do a lot more than what we were able to do in the past. And then beyond that, there's composite receivers that can be added to do noise figure. We also have the inverse FFT algorithm to convert frequency domain information to time domain, allows us to spot where we have impedance discontinuities on a line at specific locations. And even with transmission measurements, we can now look at eye diagram simulations based on S parameter transmission data. So to kind of summarize here, there are a lot of different devices. They come in, they're in different classes. We have active devices such as amplifiers, which is, we have filters, uh, adapters, circulators that are considered passive devices, uh, cables, connectors, and backplanes. That's part of the high-speed interconnect um, uh, components that we also look at with the VNA. And then we have more of the subsystem type of uh, applications. Okay, now we're going to go through some basic terminology. Um, we talk about the VNA as a, as a vector network analyzer. In the past, there were scalar network analyzers as well. Um, sure, I think. Uh, okay, uh, we have to talk about the difference between passive and active devices, and then transmission reflection measurements, which then form the, the S parameter matrix. Um, so first, vector versus scalar. Well, RF signals have not only magnitude, they have phase associated with them too. So vector captures that information, magnitude and phase of the signal. A scalar is just magnitude only. So it's pretty easy to conclude that VNA measures both, magnitude and phase. A scalar only has magnitude information. And in the past, they were quite limited in dynamic range. So over time, VNAs have pretty much replaced scalars. Uh, and uh, have become more affordable. And of course, they do a lot more. They make a lot more measurements than, than SNAs ever did before. Passive versus active devices. Um, passive devices consume energy. They don't produce energy. So we're talking about something that attenuates the signal going through. So we associate loss with that. So insertion loss will be the measurement that we look at in the transmission sense. For active devices, we apply a DC voltage. And we typically get amplification. If it's a good amplifier, we'll get amplification. And so we'll have gain associated with the transmission measurement. So uh, that's a distinct difference between the two then. One has gain, 
because it has DC bias, the other does not and has loss. So we take all of the measurements here, transmission, we look at insertion loss and gain. So basically that's gonna be the signal decreasing from input to output, or in the case of gain, increasing from out, input to output. Um, and we're looking at the ratio. So at all times we're capturing the signal that we're applying to the device, and then we're making measurements at both the, the input interface where signal is reflected back and the output where signal is transmitted through. So we're doing those ratios against what we apply to it. Because remember, this is a stimulus response instrument. Um, and in terms of re return loss, we're measuring what's being reflected at either interface. And then again, it's the ratio of what, what we measure reflected against what we um, sent in the first place from the source side. And then once we have all the transmission reflection characteristics for our two port device captured, we can then assemble them into what's called the S-parameter matrix. And here the nomenclature is very simple. The second number uh, in the subscript uh, is where we're applying the signal and the first number is where we're measuring it. So at all times we're applying a signal and then we're measuring it either uh, on the input side or the output side, depending on what we want to look at and then make the various ratios. And then once we have all the S parameters collected, we can present it in a standard format, such as the S2P format. And that's what's typically used uh, in simulation, circuit simulation. So it's a very useful notation that's used um, for, for capturing S parameter information. This is our typical setup um, in a two port case. Uh, we have a, a benchtop VNA here with two ports, port one and port two. We have test cables attached. And uh, we have a device, very simple device in this case, passive device, and we're measuring transmission. So you see the green arrow going across from port one to port two. Then we also have a green arrow reflecting back at port one. There would be a similar one at port two as well. Um, and in, in so doing, we're able to measure all of those signals, um, both the ones transmitted forward and reverse, as well as the reflected forward and reverse. And at all times, we know what we're applying. So in the denominator of our racial measurement will always be what we apply, and then the numerator will be what we measure, either in reflected or, or transmitted uh, sense. So to kind of collect the different transmission measurements that we've talked about thus far, we mentioned gain, uh, insertion loss, those are very common. Um, and those are scalar quantities, so there's really no phase associated, but then there's also phase that can be measured because we have the VNA. And then the full transmission coefficients are the full complex representation of, of the transmission that carries both the magnitude and phase information. Um, and we can separate that to real and imaginary if we don't want to just stay strictly in complex terms. Um, and we can look at electrical length, um, both in terms of distance, in terms of, of time. Um, and then we can look at, in a transmission sense, how much is our phase uh, deviating from linear? That gives us an indication of how good our, our, our linearity is and also tells us a little bit about the group delay of the device. And we'll talk about that in a moment. On the reflection side, we have return loss. That's the most common, again, a scalar measurement. Um, and then we have the full reflection coefficients, which are the complex quantities, S11, S22. Uh, we can look at these in terms of time. This is where we do the inverse FFT and get the uh, the uh, time domain information. Uh, and we can look at things on different charts, such as a Smith chart, to determine what the actual impedance is, both the real part and the imaginary part. And that tells us a lot of information about how well our circuit is matched to, say, a 50 ohm ideal case. SWR is similar to return loss, is also scalar quantity, but it's another way of looking at, at reflection. So the front panel basic view when you turn on a, a VNA and preset it, a two port, is to present the uh, S parameters in the following way, S11 in the upper left, S12 in the upper right, and then the lower left is S21 and lower right um, is S22. So this is typically how it, it will look when you, when you preset. Uh, of course, you can change things later to use different displays, um, but this is the basic presentation um, of the S parameter measurements. So it captures all of the transmission and reflection characteristics of the device. So this is kind of a copy of what you just saw in the previous slide, but this is um, 
showing uh, what we're really looking at on each particular graph. So in the Smith chart, we're going to look at reflection coefficients. So this is a complex quantity. So this is going to uh, tell us not only the, the the resistive part, but also give us the reactive part. So it's going to tell us whether something is inductive or capacitive. Same is true for the S22 on the lower right side. And then the other two graphs are showing the transmission, both magnitude and phase. So um, S21 is the forward direction, S12 um, is the reverse direction. Um, and then if we just take the scalar uh, portion of that and, and omit the, the phase, uh, then we just break down into the return loss for the, for the uh, reflection, S11 and S22. And just insertion loss, or if it was an amplifier, be gained um, for the S21 and the S12. Um, on the Smith chart, you'll notice that there are um, circles that represent constant resistance. So you can see we're in the center, we're intersecting right at 50 ohms. So that's where we want to be when we make a measurement. Typically, that's not going to be the case. And so we'll quickly be able to determine if something has. Um, an inductive part to it or a capacitive part to it because it'll either end up in the upper hemisphere, it'll be inductive, lower hemisphere will be um, capacitive. And if you have a full short, it'll end up over on the left side. If you have a full open, it'll end up on the on the right side. So there's a position here for every single impedance uh, in a complex uh, sense. So that's used more for, for, for reflection measurements. But for transmission measurements, oftentimes when we're looking at amplifiers, it might be useful to look at a polar display where the distance from the center is the magnitude and the rotation around the circle um, is the phase. And then I mentioned group delay. Group delay is specifically the rate of phase change with respect to frequency. So if you have a, a nice linear phase device, uh, then phase will change uh, as a function of a frequency will be a straight line. And therefore, when you take the slope of that, you'll get a constant um, group delay. And that's what you want to see when you're designing a filter, for example, um, because if you've got wideband uh, signals that you're trying to uh, filter through the, the device, you don't want to have um, non-uniform group delay because that'll create distortion uh, in those wideband signals. So it's important to, to make sure that the phase change is, is, is linear with respect to frequency in that case. So you can see with the filter, that as you get to the edges of the filter, you really start to see some peaks show up there. And those are the areas really to be avoided and you wanna get the signal more or less in that uh, central section where, it's, where the group flow rate is, is flat. Okay, so now we've covered the basic measurements, um, and we'll come back in a moment to those. Um, and we're going to now look at the hardware that's really behind the VNA and what's inside the VNA and how these measurements are made. So as I mentioned from the very beginning, we're dealing with an instrument that has a source. So it's a source response, um, stimulus response system. And so we have a, a full synthesized uh, signal generator in the source, and we then have a test set which includes the components that allow us to separate the transmission and reflection signals that we're interested in measuring with our receivers. So that's part of the microwave test set. And then behind all of that, we have the analyzer itself, which is really the digital analog hardware, the IF uh, sections where, where we have the A to D and the amplification at IF, and then the firmware and the software, of course, the front panel, uh, display and memory as well. So that's what makes up the building blocks um, of the VNA. <clears throat> now, if we just focus on the source and the test set part of the block diagram, so basically the RF and microwave sections, uh, we have the source at the top, we have a transfer switch that regulates which direction the signal is applied to the device under test. And then you'll see we have reflectometers that allow us to separate signals coming back from either interface, from signals going through the device in either direction. Um, and then we have four receivers in the center, two of which are gonna be known as reference receivers because they capture the signal early on, and that goes in the denominator of our ratio of measurement. Um, the, the B1 and B2 receivers 
are used to capture what either gets reflected back or gets transmitted across. So the B1 and B2 will typically end up in the numerator of our ratio measurements and A1, A2 will end up in the denominator. So if we're gonna go look at S11, we're gonna apply a signal, we're gonna uh, sample it at A1 uh, on the forward side, and then we're gonna measure the signal coming back uh, B1, and uh, that will be uh, the reflected signal from the port one interface. So we'll take B1 over A1 to get S11. And then on the transmission side, S21, again, the reference is still A1 because that's, that's the direction we're applying the stimulus. Uh, the ratio then ends up being B2 divided by A1, and that will be S21, which is our forward transmission. So that's how it works in the forward direction. And analogously, on the reverse direction, it's the exact opposite. The switch uh, goes over to the right-hand position. Signal is applied uh, from right to left in this case. And again, um, it's, it's tapped uh, at A2 as the reference and then measured at B1 for transmission and B2 for reflection in the reverse case. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about uh, the key components that were in the block diagram that you just saw. Uh, first and foremost, receivers, that's an extremely important part of the VNA. It sets a lot of the uh, specifications for the instrument, such as noise floor, uh, also um, um, IP3 or, or input compression. Uh, mixers are typically used at low frequencies. Um, they work really well down there. Uh, it's what you'll see in most RF VNAs. Uh, so when I say RF VNA, I'm, I'm referring to VNAs that are typically below uh, 8 to 10 gigahertz. And then microwave VNAs would be going higher in frequency, of course, to, to gigahertz and beyond. Um, and at those frequencies, we would want to use something that is a little more flat in terms of its uh, conversion loss. So we elect to use samplers, uh, oftentimes at higher frequencies to get better noise floor and um, more constant um, conversion loss because mixers tend to roll off at high frequencies and then you end up using uh, harmonic mixers just to be able to get to higher frequencies and, and that can translate to uh, quite a bit of loss in, in terms of uh, dynamic range of the instrument. Uh, so receivers are very important. Uh, we're using higher LO frequencies now so that we can get uh, better dynamic range, lower noise floor. We have higher IP3, so more better linearity in a lot of these receivers today. Um, and we can extend these to higher frequencies unlike ever before. So we can push these kinds of uh, sampler structures to as high as uh, 220 gigahertz, potentially even beyond. So again, the, the key benefits of the sampler technology, the flat conversion loss, the low noise floor, the higher IP3 or, or higher compression points. Um, versus the, the mixer, but mixers work very well at low frequencies. Samplers typically roll off, don't work down there. So, so there's a place for both. Uh, same with reflectometers, there's two distinct ways of doing this. You have directional couplers, which are typically used at high frequencies in, in microwave VNAs, but they are wavelength dependent. So as you get down to lower frequencies, uh, they will roll off because of the fact that they have wavelength dependence. Um, so they don't work too well at low frequencies, but directional bridges, which are used more in RF VNAs, uh, do work well down there. So in the ideal case, you would wanna be able to combine the two together, just like in the case of receivers for reflectometers, you'd like to be able to use both so that you can create the most broadband VNA possible. Same with switches. Uh, switches too have distinct technologies and therefore advantages at, at various frequency ranges. So we use FETs typically at low frequencies, pin diodes, uh, switches at higher frequencies, just to be able to optimize things like insertion loss, isolation, as well as uh, compression. Again, the IP3 or, or, or uh, uh, IMD performance of the, uh, of the switch. And then finally, the source. That, that's also very important because the source is gonna determine uh, how your uh, high level noise looks because it's related directly to the phase noise uh, of the source. So we wanna have a fairly clean source. It doesn't have to be perfect because we're, we're doing ratio measurements. So a lot of the phase noise gets canceled out when we're doing ratio measurements. Uh, but we do wanna make sure that 
they are locally synthesized. We don't need to lock it through a, uh, an IF or anything like that. We need, need to be able to have independently synthesized both in, in terms of the source as well as the LO that's used to drive the receiver um, and do the down conversion. So, but the main point here is, is phase noise and how it, how it translates to high level noise. Uh, that is a key point, especially as you go higher in frequencies uh, to the millimeter wave side. So uh, just as a quick summary, um, what we've covered so far, uh, VNA is an instrument that provides extremely uh, accurate characterization of RF and microwave devices. So we can look at not only uh, uh, the, the, the lowest sort of component in the food chain, but all the way up to subsystems that are designed um, using the various components. Uh, we're providing a ratio of measurement relative to the incident signal. So uh, basically we're capturing the incident signal that goes in our denominator, and then we're measuring either the reflection or the transmission and, and ratioing that against the, the incident signal. Uh, so, and we're providing both magnitude and phase information at all times. And uh, with these receivers uh, that we have in today's modern VNAs, we get very wide dynamic range and extremely linear performance. So that's also important. Uh, when trying to maintain accuracy of, of your measurements. You don't want to overdrive your receiver, for example. Um, the challenges that lie are we have a lot of different application uh, environments. And this is where we really spend most of our time as, as, as VNA users is trying to determine what uh, interface we're going to do our calibration at, what cal kit we're going to use. Um, so there's a lot of subtleties involved here um, depending on the application. Because as I mentioned at the beginning, a VNA uh, without the user calibration is not very useful. Um, you don't get the accuracy until you perform the calibration at the user level. Um, and we'll talk about that in, uh, in next week's uh, session. So we have a lot of different calibration choices and some post-processing tools to allow us to optimize what we're trying to measure. Um, and we'll review those uh, next week in the, in the session. And of course, we have a lot of information on our website that I welcome you to take a look at, um, both application notes and, uh, and measurement guides. So now in the remaining uh, few minutes, I'm just going to mention, um, before we go to questions, uh, I'm going to mention our product portfolio and uh, really everything we've talked about here today as far as the VNA architecture and the basic measurements applies to all of the, the different VNAs out there. Um, and Ritsu does have a very wide uh, portfolio of VNAs from the most basic, what we categorize as economy series that are mainly used to test passive devices, mainly two port, maybe a handheld like a VNA master or, or microwave site master. So there are different uh, uh, basic VNAs available at the economy level. Um, and then we have some mid-performance VNAs that have some more power control uh, go to four ports, may go to millimeter wave banded coverage. Um, those are in the performance or, or performance mid performance category. And then at the very top end, uh, the, the uh, high end performance VNA is our Vector Start series. And that's the one that has the dual architecture that I've been in, alluding to, where we really make the best of, of all the technologies available uh, to construct a uh, very wide band VNA that's able to cover kilohertz all the way up to gigahertz frequencies. So we're using combinations of, of, of component technologies to do that. Um, next, I'm gonna do a short demo. Um, I have an instrument here uh, and I'm broadcasting to you today from Morgan Hill and I have an instrument here uh, at our division site and, um, and I have it uh, connected over, over the internet here. So using a screen uh, connect software. So what I'll do is I'll bring that up. And the setup that you see there uh, is, is fairly basic. We, I have a 110 gigahertz VNA. So, well, maybe not that basic after all, if it's 110, which is a, a 70 gigahertz mainframe VNA plus uh, a test set that then interfaces to some millimeter extender modules that are on the tabletop. And then that's connected to a PC board that has a, a trace on it. So what we're going to really measure here is that trace um, and, and look at the S parameters of that. Uh, a calibration has been done at this point using a, 
a coax cow kit. In this case, since it's 110 gigahertz, a one millimeter coax cow kit. And the calibration has been done to the ends of those cables that are pictured here. So I'm going to switch over to um, my VNA screen. And uh, what you'll see here is, um, is, the, is the user interface. And um, across the top, we have some very basic menus, uh, file, channel, trace, and onward. And what's important uh, as a user is just basically to follow the flow here, um, set up your instrument uh, with the appropriate frequency that you want to cover, uh, the power level that you want to uh, test at, because remember, there's a source in here, and we can adjust the power level just as well as the frequency range. Uh, we have different sweeping capabilities. We can sweep in frequency. We can sweep in power if we're looking at um, if we're looking at compression measurements. Um, and then we have the averaging and IF bandwidth uh, controls here as well. So these allow us to optimize our measurements and provide uh, uh, a little bit of noise reduction um, at the expense of increased sweep time but sometimes we need to get that uh, additional accuracy and the IF bandwidth is really our way to adjust um, dynamic range or sensitivity versus uh, sweep time. So it's important to set up the channel the way you want it before you proceed to do the, uh, the actual user calibration. Uh, and that will cover um, next week uh, in, the, in the session. On the trace side, um, this is where you select what you want to measure. So in a, in a typical channel, uh, which is an instrument state in this case, with a calibration applied, you could have up to 16 traces. And each of these traces could be then set to a particular response. So for example, you see trace one is highlighted here. Um, and and it's currently set to S11. Um, you can see all the S parameter choices are here. We can also do user defined ratios where we maybe put a one in the denominator and therefore we're measuring power as opposed to uh, uh, a ratio. We're measuring something that's unratioed. It'll be a power measurement. Um, and we'll talk about those calibrations uh, next week as well. Um, then beyond that, we've got display. So we can choose. Uh, as I was showing earlier in the presentation, we have a variety of different ways to display our data, log magnitude, phase, real and imaginary, SWR. Um, we can look at impedance, we can look at the Smith chart, log mag and phase. We have group delay also down here at the very bottom um, of the list. And we even have the power. This would be for a non-ratio measurement. You just want to look at output power, for example, when you're doing gain compression. Um, and then we have scaling. So scaling is going to be appropriate to whatever uh, display we're, we're, we're making active. So in this case, it's the Smith chart. If I make the S21 the active uh, trace, then of course the scaling uh, is appropriate to that measurement. Um, and then finally, we have some markers that we can use uh, that we can set up on any of the traces. And and basically look at what the measurement result is at a given frequency. So those are the basic um, basic controls. Uh, channels, again, are best thought of as, as complete instrument states. This is what you want to make sure you set before uh, you begin the calibration process. And then once you've done the calibration or, or even before, you can set up what traces you want to measure. But the important thing is to get the channel defined first. And then, of course, it's always advisable to save your setup so that later you can recall it again. Um, and so that's in the file menu. So, but basically, we're going to walk through from one to eight. We're going to go all the way across the menus, um, and we'll continue this uh, next week with the uh, with the calibration view, and we'll go through some of the details of calibration, uh, both manual types and automatic calibrations, and even on wafer. Uh, kinds of cases. So I'm going to switch back to the presentation. And at this point, um, I'm going to ask if there are any questions. Uh, finished a little bit sooner than I had expected, but I think we 
got through everything reasonably well. Great. Thank you so much, Arno. Uh, we're now going to begin answering the questions that came in. I do have a few of them. Um, and everyone listening, you can still submit questions as we go through this last slide. And Arno, the first question, why does the DUT use different gender SMA connectors? And that's from Ant Ant Antonio Guillon. Okay, Antonio. Uh, so it depends on the device itself and how it's been designed. Um, often what we find is, is devices have female connectors on both input and output. Uh, but there are some instances with filters where they're designed with a male in, uh, on one end and a, and a female on the other. And this becomes part of the challenge um, as, as, as a test engineer to, to properly characterize these devices because you want to make sure that what you're measuring is purely the device and nothing else. So if I have to use adapters to adapt to something that has an opposite gender, I want to make sure that that adapter does not become part of my my measurement. So, um, so there are some techniques when we're doing calibration uh, where we can either use insertable adapters that can be swapped out to change gender so that we can measure exactly what we want to measure. There may be cases where we have to de-embed something and de-embedding just basically means that we remove it. So we have to basically characterize the adapter first and then remove it later so it doesn't become part of our measurement. The goal always is to measure only the device and everything else connecting to it needs to get removed. So that's where the challenges lie with, with multiple genders on the, on the devices. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Herbert Ariza. How does VNA replace a spectrum analyzer? Um, and then I think it said for IDM. IMD, yeah. Um, Herbert, yes. Um, what I meant to say there is that uh, a spectrum we can we can perform some of the same measurements with a VNA that would traditionally be done using a spectrum analyzer. Um, I'm not necessarily going to going to say it replaces it because there are some advantages still for the spectrum analyzer given it has a lower noise floor, et cetera. Um, but if you're if you're looking at having one instrument to do everything, then um, a VNA can serve that purpose. So we can we can make measurements such as IMD by having a dual source in the VNA and uh, creating that, that two-tone stimulus internally, or we could use an external source and, and, and combine them. Uh, and then the important thing, once we uh, connect to our device under test and look at the output side, is we need to be able to uh, offset tune our receiver to the proper frequency where we expect these IMD products to be. Um, and that's, something that modern VNAs can do very nicely now. We know where that signal is. We're measuring an, a known signal as opposed to an unknown signal. So this is where we can really excel with the VNA because we can do some things like sweeping the tones and then looking at where the IMD products are as a function of frequency. That cannot be done very easily with a spectrum analyzer because spectrum analyzer just gives you that classical IMD view with the two tones and, and the products. So, when I, so, so the vector network analyzer can in that case excel beyond a a spectrum analyzer, but I but I think it, it is a little bit strong statement to make that it, it can totally replace it because it really there's going to be things that um, a spectrum analyzer does very well and will always do well, and the spectrum analyzer has a place on this on the same test bench as the as the VNA and 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 other other RF and microwave instruments. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Al Gorino. Can you quickly review NF measurements? or will that be in a later date, specifically composite receiver? Hey Al, how you doing? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I wasn't planning on covering noise figure in this session because this is more of a basic session, but uh, noise figure, again, can be done with a spectrum analyzer. So there's another example of a, of a, of a case where, where uh, spectrum analyzers can do the same measurement. Sometimes they excel at doing that more than the VNA. But again, to do it with the VNA requires us to have a composite receiver because we need to um, get our noise floor down as low as possible. So we need some preamplification to do that. Um, so it, it becomes an additional accessory that has to get added onto the VNA to make noise figure measurements and 
where the VNA excels again in this case is, is that we can do these things under swept conditions and actually look at noise figure as a function of frequency. Um, but no, I, in this case, no. We'll look at possibly covering noise figure in a, in a future um, uh, webinar. But this is more, more about fundamentals today. Thanks for the question, Al. Okay. Um, Arno, can you confirm that um, showing mixture measurement is also going to be in a future session? Sorry, what was that mix mix mixer mix, measurement? Mixer measurement. In, are we going to have that in a future session? Um, we'll look at that. Um, I I don't have a plan right now, but uh, we can that look at from, that. It yeah, will that was involve, from Jay Johnson. Okay, Jay. Um, yeah, we'll look at we'll look at including that as another topic in the future because uh, we have, we can have a lot of different topics on VNAs. Uh, certainly, given the versatility and flexibility of this instrument, there's lots of measurements. Uh, that a VNA can make. Um, but most importantly for the mixer measurement is going to be having, again, that ability to uh, offset tune the receiver to where uh, we expect the output uh, signal to be in the case of a mixer. Just like in the case of IMD, uh, we have to be able to uh, independently move the receiver to a different frequency from the source because that's, that's the way the mixer works. It's frequency translating. Okay. Next question is from Francisco Romero. What is the best site for Anritsu VNA measurements examples? I would say, Francisco, it would be our website. Um, we do have a, a number of application notes there that describe um, different application scenarios with VNAs. Um, that would be my best advice. We also have a document there called the Calibration and Measurement Guide that goes into a lot of uh, detail about the various measurements we can make with the VNA. Um, so I think the best resource would, would, would be our, our website under the VNA page. Thank you. The next question is from Michael Ramsdale. In your real-time measurement, your DUT shows the phase rippling and not flat. Is this because the passive trace has reactive characteristics? What sort of passive device would have a linear phase plot? Okay, uh, well, um, hi, Michael. Uh, probably the best example for linear phase would be a cable, something that you insert or an adapter. Um, I think the reason why you didn't see it in that live demo in the phase plot was because it's happening so quickly. It's it's reversing back and forth between 180 degrees back and forth because it's high frequency. Um, so I would I would say it needs to be something a little bit shorter in terms of uh, the wavelength um, to be able to actually see the linear phase. But yes, what you want to see is 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 phase that is essentially a straight line, but um, as you know, if we go up to 180, we're going to flip back over to minus 180 and we're going to start over again. So it's kind of hard to spot that in the way that the display was set up. Okay. Jay Johnson has another question. Can you show how to do a mixer measurement? Oh, in a future se session? Yeah. Okay. We will consider that, yes. Okay. And then let's see. Okay, then Herbert, the last question I have is for Herbert Ariza. Um, what um, site master cannot measure shot and open in Smith chart? What um, um, why I, some site masters cannot measure um, sh shot and open in Smith chart? Okay, so it depends if the site master has the ability to show the the Smith chart. That's the that's really going to be the display format that. Uh, will allow you to see the complex um, impedance representation. If you're just looking at return loss in the normal site master mode, um, then you would not uh, necessarily be able to see that. Uh, it has to be more in the VNA sense where we have the uh, uh, Smith chart display available. So uh, it's probably the mode of the instrument that needs to be set to be, to be able to view, um, to view the, the Smith chart. Okay, that is the last question I have, Arno. So again, um, I'll share 
these comments. Thank you so much for them with Arno and he'll review the questions if there was anything over cited. Um, so on, on behalf of Anritsu Company and our presenter, thank you all for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thank you all for joining. Stay safe out there.